This one is about Wayne. Uh, Mr. Gone <laughs> is what they called him. Wayne Shorter, born in 1933 in Newark, New Jersey, right across the river from the city, baby. He grew up in a musical family. His father supported it. His older brother played alto sax until he got to college and switched to trumpet. And uh, father thought that uh, little Wayne, not that little Wayne, Wayne Shorter, little Wayne Shorter, should study the clarinet. And he did. And uh, he eventually switched to the saxophone because his brother switched from saxophone to trumpet, I guess. So he left a saxophone hanging around the house. Uh, Wayne went to the very famous uh, Newark Arts Academy. A lot of great musicians came out of that school. Wayne uh, came out of there, and graduated in 1952, and uh, right you know, in the middle of the hot bebop era, the transition to hard bop, all of that, you know, Miles Davis has got his whole cool thing happening, man, this is a great time for jazz, and he's right across from the city, and wow, it's just so easy. So Wayne decides that he's gonna go to New York University, I mean, and, and, and not the one that Miles went to. He actually went to school. <laughs> yeah, he actually went to school. And he stayed for four years. He actually stayed for four years and got a degree in music education, which would lead one to believe that Wayne was going to be a high school band director or a middle school band director or whatever. Well, that didn't happen. Wayne went into the Army instead, like a lot of musicians who ended up being jazz personalities did. He went into the Army and, um, and played there. And uh, some of the people he met along the way included uh, the great Horace Silver, a uh, great pianist and um, composer uh, who would also make his mark uh, on the scene uh, in New York. As uh, fortune would have it, one of the first professional gigs that uh, Wayne got uh, once he graduated from college and finished the Army and came back was with a group that Horace Silver had helped to start along with Art Blakey, and that was the Jazz Messengers. That's right. Horace was one of the original messengers. He and Art started that thing together. But uh, they had some artistic differences, so Horace Silver left and did his own thing, and, uh, and uh, Buana, he kept going with their jazz messages, and soon uh, Wayne was on board as saxophone player, and then later as um, band leader of the Messengers, and then later as a chief composer, because not only was he a stunning player and improviser, he was also a um, magical um, composer, just great, great writer, and write different stuff too. Uh, but you know, Art Blakey's thing was straight, hard, funky, shuffle, swing, baby, right down the middle. And Wayne was all into that, but it, it was a little bit limiting for Wayne. And uh, pretty soon, uh, Miles Davis would be starting his second great quintet with Herbie and um, Tony Williams. You know, after moving around through a few saxophone players, uh, he settled on Wayne. He finally persuaded Wayne to leave the Messengers, and Wayne came on over. And one of the main reasons that Wayne came over is because of that rhythm section. Not so much Miles, but because of that rhythm section that was doing all of these new flowing, freer things in jazz that gave Wayne more of a wide palette for his playing and for his composition. Wayne loved playing with Miles Davis. And Miles loved having Wayne in the band. And as someone uh, uh, explained, uh, Wayne was about the only cat they would bring a composition into Miles and they would play it just like Wayne had brought it in and not have it altered by Miles. And when somebody questioned Miles about this, 
Marvis Bunny, Wayne, come in with his chart together. Not only is his chart together, he writes out all the parts for everybody exactly like he wants you to play it. So ain't no doubt about what Wayne is doing. Therefore, there's no need for me to say nothing. Just let Wayne speak. Yeah. <laughs> so Wayne becomes a major influence with Miles Davis's group, especially in terms of the compositions. And there are many who would say that during that period and his later years, Wayne may have been the greatest living improviser of all times. Now, he played the tenor saxophone almost exclusively until about 1968. And I think the last album that he played tenor sax on with Miles was Fides de Kilimanjaro. Uh, by the time Miles is making a transition into fusion and more electric driven music, Wayne is spending some time with the soprano saxophone, which as those of you who are knowledgeable of instruments would know, it is pitched exactly the same as the clarinet. As a matter of fact, Sidney Bechet, way back in the day, went from the clarinet to the soprano saxophone just because the soprano saxophone was louder and cut more and he could be heard in the ensemble better. So very similar instruments in terms of the pitch relationships, but very different in terms of the timbre or the color of the sound. So Wayne likes this soprano saxophone. He started using it on recordings and in live performances somewhere around the uh, latter part of uh, 1968, 1969. Most certainly used it on In a Silent Way, and he most certainly used it on Bitches Brew, which was the groundbreaking recording by um, Miles, but also um, it was uh, the last recording that um, Wayne would do with Miles. Uh, he did do some more dates, but Wayne had looked to do his own thing. And um, the amazing thing about it is that in charting his new path, about the same time that he is doing The Bitches Brew, he's doing one of his first fusion albums called Supernova. And he's using two of the musicians he met doing uh, Bitches Brew. Uh, the great uh, and local personality here, uh, Chick Corea uh, on keyboards, and uh, the Englishman uh, John McLaughlin uh, on guitar uh, were major contributors to that uh, supernova. Um, not long after that, um, Wayne connected with another a loom of the um, Miles Davis group, uh, Joe Zolano, who I think participated in In a Silent Way. And he, along with a bass pair named Miroslav Vitus. Uh, we don't know a lot about Miroslav because he actually uh, returned to Europe. And um, so his work, his body of work, was very short-lived in this country. He was one of the original weather report groups and uh, when the group was started, it was started by three people, Zawinu, Shorta, and Vitus. But after Vitus left, um, it was then a partnership between uh, Zawinu and Shorta, and they simply moved all the musicians through there, whether it's Don Elias, or Flora Purim, or Yerto, or Johnson, or the great Jaco Pastorius, or, 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 um, to serve their needs in that group. And that was one of the great supergroups. Weather Report is one of the great supergroups. And um, Wayne and uh, Joe stayed together uh, with that project until the time they decided to go uh, their separate ways again. Um, Joe, who went off to do uh, his uh, Zawinul Syndicate, and um, Wayne, who relaunched his solo career and he did albums, uh, studio recordings as well. Um, but he also uh, pretty much stayed with the electric fusion thing for quite some time. 
And uh, like Nancy Wilson for almost 10 years, uh, he preferred to do live recordings. So some of the best recordings that he had done during this period of time, uh, 80s and 90s, were live albums. And sometimes you'd have a live album uh, with a couple of studio tracks, and sometimes you'd have a studio album with a couple of live tracks, but Wayne's preference was for the live tracks. Even when he went back to doing more acoustic uh, music with his uh, famous acoustic uh, uh, quartet, uh, somewhere around 2000, uh, Brian Blade, uh, Patitucci, and Nilo Perez on piano, uh, it's a group I actually heard uh, in Tampa, I think a, a USF perhaps, uh, just one of the major kill groups. If you missed that one, you missed, you missed real jazz at, at the highest level and one of the last times to hear uh, the great Wayne Shorter at the height of his, his power. I mean, it was just tremendous and such a great supporting cast. And even with that acoustic group, Wayne preferred the live recording. There's just the chemistry and the energy that comes from performing for a live audience, the spirit that is involved in that, that you, you just can't get in a studio situation and, and Wayne did not like Memorex either. He wanted his music live. And he did that for quite some time. Uh, when he did uh, return uh, to studio, he did a little bit with the acoustic group and then went back to doing uh, some fusion things. He has had some tragedy in his life um, that has sidelined him for a time. Uh, his first marriage ended in divorce after a couple of years and one kid. And uh, his second marriage was going very, very well until um, his wife and niece decided to join him uh, in Italy um, when he was on tour and they were flying from JFK on the ill-fated uh, TWA flight 800 that exploded off the coast of New York and we still have questions as to why it happened and what was the nature of the situation. Bottom line is Wayne lost his soulmate and uh, his niece uh, while he was on tour in Italy. So um, his last wife uh, was a committed Buddhist and uh, Wayne had been practicing Buddhism for quite some time. So um, he was always a very peaceful, uh, spirited person and uh, continued to pursue and practice Buddhism to this very day. Uh, he's now in his 80s and he has uh, stopped uh, live performing. Uh, he has not stopped composing. He composes whenever he feels like it. <laughs> he gotta leave the house to compose. And, uh, but he is in ill health at an advanced age in the 80s. And, uh, but we still have his recordings. We still have his recordings. We still have his compositions. Many of them are standards that many young jazz lions are, how shall I say, discovering and exploring as they try to hone their craft. And Wayne's music is complicated <laughs> and challenging, so uh, a rite of passage is to do some Wayne Shorter tunes. So um, that continues to go, the recordings go, the compositions go, the spirit of Wayne continues to go, and he still walks among us. Maybe a little slower than he used to, but he still walks among us. So please, let's pray that Wayne can return to the stage and bless us in a live performance again. But until that time, we do have those recordings, both studio and live, from the Jazz Messengers, of the 50s to Miles Davis of the 60s and Weather Report of the 70s and the solo projects and orchestral things of the 80s and 90s and 2000, the solo 
uh, albums and the acoustic group in 2000. We have a lot of stuff. Wayne had received several uh, Grammys for his performance, uh, Best Instrumental uh, Jazz 2004, I think I remember, and then Best Jazz Soloist back in the 90s, and a couple others. Uh, so he's been recognized, and if you look at uh, the list of recordings that he has participated in, uh, it's like pages long. He has been a very prolific musician, both in terms of his performances, his recordings, and his compositions. So, Wayne, although they call you Mr. Gone, he's not quite gone yet. He's still with us. And after he does leave this plane of existence, his music will be with us forever. Thank you, Wayne Shorter. <laughs>